I'm Harriet Vance Ball, Associate Professor of Medicine from McMaster University, and I'm here with Radcliffe to discuss the exciting findings of the hypertension trial in Nigeria. And I'm here with Dr. DK Oji. Welcome to Radcliffe. Thank you very much. We are here following his presentation at the late breaking clinical trial stage. Um, and he represents the rarity of a PI from an African country who led a trial that he's going to talk about. Tell us about your research question, DK. Thank you very much. So um, our trial is titled Hypertension Treatment in Nigeria, and it's a large observational trial. And really what we set out to do was to be able to develop an implementation pathway mm -hmm. in the public primary healthcare facilities in Nigeria, starting with the Federal Capital Territory, so that we'll be able to treat or manage hypertension, especially uncomplicated hypertension. Mm -hmm. And this came about because of the burden of high blood pressure globally, but especially in Africa. Mm -hmm. For example, in Nigeria, the prevalence is between 30 to 40 percent, which mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. And before now, there is no system of management of high blood pressure in the public primary health care. The public primary health care in most low and middle income countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, has focused on infectious diseases. But now there is a paradigm shift to be able to manage chronic diseases, especially mm -hmm. non-communicable diseases in the public primary health care. And one way to do that is through the route of high blood pressure. Why high blood pressure? Because it's the leading risk factor for cardiovascular disease in most parts of the world and in Nigeria for that matter. I know also that high blood pressure is a normal one risk factor for poor health. So what we set out to do was to say, to be able to, at the end of our trial, show that different multi-level strategies, mm -hmm. including promotion of a simplified protocol. Number two, using a team-based approach led by non-physician healthcare workers, in this case, community health extension workers. Mm -hmm. Then, using some own blood pressure monitoring. And in addition to that, also being able to register these patients in this public primary healthcare facilities. We're going to show that through this, blood pressure can be controlled in the community. So it's actually a community approach, mm -hmm. a large longitudinal trial to be able to bring health, mm -hmm. hypertension treatment down to the population. And I believe that is the best way to go in our modern I day. love your intervention and I could tell that you have an implementation science background. So what framework did you use to guide your work? Thank you very much. So at the formative stages, mm -hmm. we use more of a, a CIFA mm -hmm. consolidated framework in implementation research. Mm -hmm. We also leverage a framework that was really around uh, um, 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 uh, assessing, you know, um, uh, facilities mm -hmm. at the primary healthcare level, what mm -hmm. we call the PHCPI framework. It's really for um, assessing um, different domains at the mm -hmm. primary care level, but mm -hmm. basically we use the CIFA mm -hmm. framework, and that informed our formative stages. Okay. So a multi-level intervention designed to target the healthcare system, the clinician, and the patient yeah. using these implementation science frameworks. Now tell us about your study design. Okay, so our study design was a type two hybrid. So mm -hmm. we were, as we're implementing, we were also evaluating type two, and then it was interrupted time series design. Mm -hmm. And why interrupted time series? Because before now, there is no light data no baseline data for us to leverage. So we needed to do that. So that, which means that interrupted time series means that we had to collect some data, 
pre-intervention, then intervene also, you know, and mm -hmm. see what is the difference in terms of blood pressure control, treatment rate, and so on and so forth. Right, so you didn't use a randomized clinical trial no. as your study design. No. Tell us about the benefits that an interrupted case series offers over a sort of observational um, data. Oh, data, great. So, so interrupted uh, case series design, time series design, offers the benefit of being able to compare mm -hmm. your pre-intervention mm -hmm. then and your post-intervention. Remember that before this time, no baseline data. If you have baseline data, you might not really need an interrupted time series design. But there was no such data at all, no large data at all mm -hmm. in this population. So we needed that interrupted time series to say, okay, now we will collect data, observational data. Patient came to the clinic. Once you are 18 years and above, we measure your blood pressure. We use the same simplified uh, treatment protocol mm -hmm. developed by the Federal Ministry of Health of Nigeria then to start your medication. But meanwhile, there might not be those medications in those facilities. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You go to the community pharmacy and then get your medication mm -hmm. simply. Then that is more of the pre-implementation phase. At the post-implementation -implement phase, now what did we do? We now introduce a system to make sure that the medications are available in those clinics. Mm -hmm. Remember that you cannot treat high blood pressure without good medications. Mm -hmm. And most of the time we say now, good generic medication for that matter. So, and we, we put this intervention so that we can compare what has happened during the pre-implementation phase and what has happened during the post-implementation phase. So comparing them. So in targeted time series, the beauty about it is that at least we can have baseline observational data. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that we were able to collect about 5,000 mm -hmm. of those you know, participants' data within the pre-implementation phase. Mm -hmm. And what did you do to minimize any risk of bias from learning the intervention or you know, how did you mitigate great. that risk? Yes, great. Thank you very much. So we did training and retraining. Mm -hmm. of these non-physician healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And these non-physician healthcare workers comprised the community health extension workers, pharmacy technicians, because mm -hmm. they're quite needed where mm -hmm. you don't have the pharmacist mm -hmm. to be able to, to, to dispense the medication. Mm -hmm. And we also had m medical record officers to mm -hmm. be able to capture the data. Mm -hmm. So we did training, retrain of these persons. Then we're capturing our data in the red cap of University of Abuja. Mm -hmm. And then we did a quality analysis of those data and checks. And every two weeks, mm -hmm. we're going to get reports. Mm -hmm. And when we see low quality data, we brought back those people to our facility or we went down to their facility to train them. In addition to that, we did every three months, there's a monitoring team mm -hmm. going to do an audit mm -hmm. of what is happening. So it was okay. really, really, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration, really, really trying to build a system. You know, Tell us about collection. the drugs that you used as the therapeutic intervention. All right, thank you very much. For, so the drugs we used are amlodipine, mm -hmm. which is a calcine channel blocker. Mm -hmm. One, then we used lucertan, mm -hmm. which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, and we used thiazide diuretics. Mm -hmm. Now we went for Losartan instead of medication like angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor because of the side effects mm -hmm. that can come from angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor like, like Sunopri and Ramipri. Remember, one of them is dry cough. Mm -hmm. And in the black population, it is said that it is more, they have more dry cough mm -hmm. from ACIs mm -hmm. compared to the Caucasian population, the Asian population in about five to 10% of persons. And beyond that also, there can be angioneuroedema, which is also more in the black population. So we decided to use a more, um, um, uh, uh, the lucertan, mm -hmm. which is more tolerable, mm -hmm. you know, in this population, even though a little bit more expensive. So we used that too. And they were in dif different combinations. So remember I said that 
single POFs, those combinations, mm -hmm. was one of the things we are pushing for. Mm -hmm. So we have amlodipine as a monotherapy. Mm -hmm. Then we have amlodipine lucertan single peak combination. As a step up? Yes, as a mm -hmm. step up. Then we had amlodipine lucertan and hydrochlorothiazide. Right. And most of our patients ended up using amlodipine and amlodipine lucertan. And okay. very few of mm -hmm. them needed the three combinations. And that tells you about catching blood pressure early in the community. Mm -hmm. When you get them early in the community, they tend to respond very well. Mm -hmm. you know? And that is one of the lessons we learned from our study. So notwithstanding the limitations of the study design, tell us what your estimated treatment effect was. Yes, so we, we were able to demonstrate that using what we call a three-month rolling average, mm -hmm. that our treatment rates mm -hmm. improved significantly and it improved from about 77%, you know, baseline down to about 97% within that period. And then our control rate you know, also improved significantly mm -hmm. from about 23% to about 56%. So it was more than doubled mm -hmm. control rate mm -hmm. for those people. Yeah. And why do you think that happened? Okay, that happened because it was, we used a multi-level intervention. Mm -hmm multi-level. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure or hypertension treatment is beyond giving patient medications. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of community awareness mm -hmm. so people came to the clinic. Mm -hmm. Number one, we did a lot of formative work mm -hmm. to be able to know, you know, what was the best approach mm -hmm. to get the people down. Apart from that, we did a lot of formative among the healthcare workers. So the buy-in was great mm -hmm. by these people. So they saw it as theirs, right. as having ownership of that program beyond just carrying out research. So good things. good for patient care, but bad for the study in the sense that there was some contamination. That's so you, true. you're going to comment on the treatment difference. And yeah. was there a significant treatment difference based on your primary outcome? Yes, there was. So, so we found out that treatment um, 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 prescription rate improved significantly. Okay. between baseline and also uh, post-implementation, which our uh, post-implementation, uh, because this study is on, still ongoing, mm -hmm. since these are early re results, mm -hmm. it's ongoing, is around the three months ruling average in the last three months. That is what we are using. So there was improve, and also the control rate also improved. It was significant. Yeah. The blood pressure control blood rate? Blood pressure control rate Tell and also that. treatment. Yeah, the blood pressure control rate improved from 23% to about 56% from the baseline to three months, the last three months, which is a ruling average we're using because this is an interrupted time series design. So that is it. The only thing we also found out was that in terms of a rate of change of blood pressure, mm -hmm. it happened to be more in the pre-implementation phase compared to the implementation phase. And we have looked at that. Why is this so? It just comes down to the fact that management of high blood pressure is beyond just giving mm -hmm. free medication or, or, or giving medications at a subsidized price. It is multi-factor. It has to be at multi-level because we did a lot of formative work there was a lot of buy-in. People were enthusiastic. So even when they did not have those medications, you know, they, they were ready to get to the community. We did a lot of community awareness campaign telling them about the dangers of high blood pressure. So every three months, we leverage the community healthcare workers who are health educators and also community mobilizers to do like a mobilization campaign for them. So they use IAC materials, you know, with pictorial right. forms, and then so they did a lot of education. So, so buy-in was quite great. Mm -hmm. Learning curve was steep. Of course, after a time, it plateaued. Mm -hmm. It will definitely do that because at the time it was as if there was mastery in a way mm -hmm. of that. So it plateaued. Yeah. So the intervent there was uptake of the intervention yeah. before the implementation. Before the implementation, phase, yes. And uh, then you saw a steep rise. Steep rise. Uptake and, and then, then a plateauing, off. leveling, and I remember that our intervention was just keep making sure that there was a supply chain. 
-hmm. That was our intervention. That was the difference between the pre-implementation and implementation phase. Yeah. Were there any other secondary endpoints that you would like to share with us? Yes, um, so, so apart from the control rate and treatment rate, the systolic blood pressure mm -hmm. reduced from 146 millimeters of mercury in the pre-implementation phase to about 134 millimeters. So we had a 12 millimeters drop in the systolic blood pressure. That was also similar for the diastolic blood pressure, mm -hmm. reducing from about 91 to 84 mm -hmm. millimeters of mercury. So we found that also to be quite interesting. And then the other thing we found was that in terms of multi-drug mm -hmm. combination drug prescription, it improved. Mm -hmm. Remember when we did for the baseline, about 58% were on therapy, but it was suboptimal. Mm -hmm. They were mainly on monotherapy, mm -hmm. but our intervention showed that we improved that from 43% to about 90%. Then the use of fixed dose or single peak combination improved from 58% to 97%. What was your sample size and what were some of the baseline characteristics of these patients? Good, so, so when we, when we um, uh, set out this, our, our sampling was ba was around having at least um, um, patient visits of about 50,000, that was minimum, but now we are hovering at about 133,000 participant visits. That is what we are hovering at, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, the, um, so that is really what we set out to do and we have exceeded that limit yeah so the analysis was by visits not by individual patients by visit you know by visit we looked at it both at patient level at facility level at visit level we looked mm -hmm. at because we also wanted to look at what retention mm -hmm. is all about in these people and on the average we got a retention of about 41 to 45 percent in these individuals you know and some clinics did far better some were over around 60 70 and a lot of things, you know, determine that what is the um, what is the um, the enthusiasm of the people. No matter how you train, some people will be more enthusiastic. The healthcare worker they pass a message more to the people, mm -hmm. you know, and so on and so forth. So some facilities had better control, but on the average, is about was about 41 to 45 percent. And really looking at that, really remember that hypertension is one of the most difficult conditions to have a retention. Mm -hmm because you are dealing with asymptomatic individuals. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. happens. So looking at that retention rate, we feel that was fair enough. And that because we use this multi-level intervention. Did uh, you do any hierarchical um, analysis to uh, account for the clustering of the center? Mm -hmm. the, the clinician? Yeah, we, we are still doing that. And in fact, we looked at at a point the retention and we looked at what are the characteristics, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of retention, you know? Mm -hmm. Is it how far is it from the CT and, and those, uh, where we, we found certain things which is quite preliminary. Mm -hmm. And so maybe in our main paper, we're going to do some deep dive, you know, Good. into some of those things to see um, how, you know, some of these factors. Of course, those are the issues about interrupted time series design, you know, I mean, some of those factors that you have to deal with, but that was of the course. best way for now to have a very large data. We need those type of data to plan. I remember Absolutely. one thing we are a aiming at is to be able to have some good policy briefs that want to use to inform policy and uh, this data transforming policy in Nigeria in terms of pushing NCDK mm -hmm. into the public primary health care because that's the best way to go. Otherwise, the strokes will continue. The heart failure will continue. The chronic kidney disease will continue. Those are the issues. Well, let me congratulate you on a commendable effort to really tackle what is a globally um, important condition that is a single biggest risk factor for so many cardiovascular diseases in a pragmatic way in a large trial and an yeah. interrupted time, time series, series design. design. Um, and uh, congratulations on your presentation. Thank you very much. How exciting yeah. to talk about implementation science, science. with you. <laughs> In America, Health Association meeting. <laughs> From Nigeria to Philadelphia. <laughs> to Philadelphia. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> so nice Thank to you. Meet you. Thank you very much.